and I said, look, don't worry about me. You guys just take care of yourselves. All right, I'm okay. I'll be fine. He said, no, you won't. He said, and I want you to pray with me right now. So he started praying with me, and I started weeping. I just wept like a baby. And I never really told him how strung out I was at the time or how desperately depressed I was. But that prayer helped wake me up. I really can't believe it. I'm sitting here in the TBN studio with someone I've known since, uh, as an actor, since I was a kid. Yes, since I was a kid. Uh, Clifton Davis, I don't know where to begin. First of all, I will simply say, thank you for being here. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. It's a privilege and a pleasure. I got to tell you, I, you have a resume, so to speak, or an IMDB page or whatever it is that is so eclectic, so broad. I confess to you when you walked in the studio here that, that it, growing up in the 70s watching TV, because I was just you know a TV addict watching every sitcom, whatever, uh -huh. I know you as you know, the star uh, or one of the two stars of That's My Mama. Yes. And you laugh because I think you have done so much since then. People today probably would know you from Madam Secretary. Yes. With yes. Taya Leone. There are very few people that, that have the breadth that, that you do. I mean, you were Thank on you. a lot of folks. Yes, and I do I say that absolutely as a, as a compliment. But you've done a ton of theater. Uh, yes, quite a bit us. of theater, which doesn't show up on IMDb. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I've so I've been blessed to do eight Broadway shows. I mean, seriously, wow! Eight Broadway shows and another ten, twelve, fifteen regional theater and tours, and off Broadway. So a lot of theater inter mingled with my career. It's been a real blessing. Well, I know that you're even in New York to host a TBN show. You do that from time to time. Yes, I do. Um, let me let me ask you, uh, how did you find your way into the theater and into the acting life? What was that, that path for you? Well, my mother, in order to spare my life, once I got caught in a stolen boat uh -oh. with a friend of mine, yeah. Uh, said, you need to move on and go to a, a school off, away from here. So I went to a private high school in Pennsylvania and came back after high school. It was during that period, uh, as I started working as a, a, a video engineer in Huntington, Long Island, uh, I went to see my first Broadway show, and I was blown away. What was it? It was The Apple Tree. Oh, I don't even know that one. Barbara Harris and Barbara. Alan Alda. Oh! Oh, my God. At the Schubert. Are you ready? At yeah. the Schubert Theater. So this must have been, the, what, was this the 60s? When was this? This was the 60s. This was 1966, uh, 60, early 67. Right. 1967. Yeah. I saw this. I had gone to work by this time for ABC Television as a video engineer. So I was working in master control. I was permanent there. And I saw this show and went to my boss over at Systems Maintenance and said, I'm sorry, I got to quit and try show business. He said, what's wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> said, are yeah. you crazy? He Take said, care. come on, Cliff, you're appointing it. If you stick around here for just another 20, 19 years, because you've been here a year already, if you stay another 19, you'll get the gold watch, you'll only be 41. I said, man, I've got to try this. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep this job open for you for six months. Six months. You get a leave of absence. If you decide you don't want to try it, you can come back and go to work for us. Six months later, I was on Broadway. Are you serious? I'm serious. God now listen, is my witness. That, you shouldn't say this in public because you're going to encourage young people to think that show business is an easy road. Oh, no. It can wasn't you, but can you even imagine six months you're on Broadway? Can well, you imagine? A lot of things had to fall into place. And well, going to the right place at the right time and doing auditions. I went to audition for a new show that was coming out called Hair. Are you kidding me? No, I auditioned for the first original hair 
but uh, they said, you got a really nice voice, but do you have any experience at all? And I said, no. They said, all right, well, go, go f- get some experience and then come back. You know, we'll be doing replacements and whatnot. Uh, go get some experience in summer stock and come back and see us. I yeah. said, okay, yeah. thank you. Then I turned, and I turned back and said, uh, excuse me, what's summer stock? And they looked at me and knew I was green as, you know, yesterday's apples. So sure enough, that summer, there was an opening for an intern, and I went off to do summer stock. And they had me cleaning bathrooms, painting stages and sets, and hanging lights, and, and watching theater being produced. And little by little, I got the idea. It was three plays that summer, plus two children's theater productions. And I got the lead in one of the children's theater productions where I played Lancelot the Reindeer. It was the <laughs> first role I had. The very first role I had, however, was Hecky the dr- cab driver in Funny Girl, which was playing in summer stock. But my line was, uh, Mrs. Bryce, Miss Bryce, your cab is here. Your cab is here. Yeah. Your cab is here. Uh, Miss Bryce, your cab is here. Unbelievable. That's how I deliver it. Unbelievable. It was my first acting. <laughs> so you, okay, so you do that, and yep. then what do you do? You go back to hair? No, I did, I did the whole summer. I did the shows. One of the dancers uh, from the Summer Stock Professional Company right. uh, was talking about going to New York to audition for a new version of Hello, Dolly that was all black. And I was curious, and I learned about it and asked about it. Yeah. And this was late in the summer. And uh, so he was going, so I went to New York uh, to see about this audition. And I couldn't get in because it was union only. So Of course. I went back to summer stock, and a week later, I came to the open call. There were 500. I'm going to make this quick. There were 500 people out there for this open call. They were looking for three more singers. I went in, waited my turn, sang my few bars. They liked it, asked me to stay. Then it was down to about 50. And they asked me to sing again. And could you hold that note at the end? Nothing can stop me now. They said, thank you. That's just showing off. 50 years later, you can still (laughs) hold that note. Oh, my God. And ah. I got into the chorus of Hello, Dolly. Now, who was in the black? I didn't even know that there was a black version of oh Hello, Dolly. My. Who was in that? Pe- was- Pearl Bailey. Pearl Bailey. And Cab Calloway. It was phenomenal. Pearl Bailey. They got a special Cab Tony. Calloway. It was amazing. I was just a kid in them days. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, now, look, you didn't have done so much. Did I, did my eyes deceive me that you wrote a song? For the Jacksons? I wrote a number of songs for the Jacksons. I mean, how, who can't say in this studio of all this crew, we've all written songs for the Jacksons, <laughs> but you've written, an, no, seriously, like, I can't even believe that. So you're also a songwriter. Yeah. How in the world did you come, I know we're leaping around, to, to write songs for the Jackson Five? After I was in Hello, Dolly, I was in between shows one Wednesday or Saturday, right. and I went down to the pit uh, to play the pit piano. I thought I was going to get into trouble when Judd Walden, the, the pit piano player uh, for the orchestra, came back and said, hey, Clifton, what, what? he knew my name because I was an understudy. He said, what are you playing? I said, oh, I'm just doodling, noodling. He said, you need to write that noodling down. That sounds like music. Yeah, that's, that's a song. So uh, he wrote, and had, was in the process of writing a, a new Broadway show called Raisin. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. So Really? Yeah. So he asked me to help him put some soul into his music. And uh, this he is, also... No, this is one of those ho- like Hollywood... Ho- like you, it's <laughs> like we're making it up. Uh, I bumped into a guy and he said, Hey, I need you to put some soul into my music. And it became Raisin. <laughs> come on. Really? So you said that this guy Judd pulls you into songwriting for Raisin and no. that, no. 
just to help him arrange. Oh, for arranging. Yeah, he had his songs. He and Bob Britton had written their score. And they had a, a gospel song that was a jazz waltz. And they kind of felt the jazz waltz wasn't truly gospel or sound like that. And I grew up in the church, so I knew a little bit about Mahalia Jackson and and the Five Blind Boys and, and some other real gospel. So I took this song, He Come Down This Morning, and instead of going I said, no, no, we got to go. He come down this morning. Ooh, he come down this morning. Oh, man. Anyway, I you helped know, him make it You know, it you have just been, the Lord just like, dump buckets of talent on you you know that and that you are so blessed it is funny though because you it's just you just have that as a gift and then and and here you are walking into uh into places where those gifts are very early on being recognized and put to use Uh, and it seems to me that that would lead pretty quickly to writing other songs yes it did it did indeed and um so i continued writing with judd's encouragement and uh, I happened to be dating a young lady named Melba Moore at I'll the cut, time. Cut it out now. <laughs> the name dropping, it's unseemly. <laughs> Albin, this has to stop. Uh, you happen to be, I like it, I was dating a lady who happened to be named Melba Moore. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's, so uh, let's see what happens now. So okay. Melba was headlining at Caesars Palace in Vegas. Okay. And I was to accompany her there. Okay. And while there, one of my friends had gotten a job as the road manager for the Supremes. They were at the Frontier Hotel while Melba was at the Caesars Palace. So they called me for lunch and uh, they said, you want to come over and meet with the Supremes? I said, I got a song for them. I would love to meet them. So he brought me in backstage into the dressing room, and sure enough, there was a piano sitting there. And I said, hey, ladies, it's wonderful to see you. They said, hi. By that time, uh, let's see, no, by that time I had been working hard on Broadway and I was moving up, so I had a little name. And uh, I said, I wrote a song for you. Really, for us, you wrote it for us, or did you just write it? I said, no, no, I wrote this with you in mind, and I started to play it. It's called Here Comes the Sunrise. And so I played the song on the piano. They loved it. They said, our producer will be here tomorrow. Are you still in town? I said, I'll make sure I am. So Frank Wilson came in the next day, heard the song, loved it, and said, I want to cut it on the Supremes. And when I went out two months later to write, sign the contract for the song for the Supremes, a producer popped his head in the door at Motown and they said, oh, say hi to uh, uh, Mr. Davis. His first name escapes me. Uh, He's the producer for the Jackson 5. I said, what? I said, hey, I got a song I wrote for Michael. He said, let me hear it. I got five minutes. I played the song on the piano. He stopped me halfway through. He said, wait a minute, slow it down a little bit, will you? Because I had it up like A, B, C, one, two, three, never can say goodbye. No, 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 no. He said, no. He said, slow it down a little bit. That's why, that's why he's a producer for the Jackson 5, right? Yeah. yeah, he slowed it down and he went, that's a smash I'll take it. And that's how I got into Motown. I mean, uh, I know you're just making this up off the top of your head, (laughs) but uh, this is like a Forrest Gump story. Every time you turn around, you bump into like another big star. But I mean, you know, uh, during the 70s, obviously, you, you saw a lot. And you saw success on a sitcom. So, you know, people who don't go to the theater, they know who you are. And, um... But you said that uh, you, 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 hit, you hit bottom. I hit bottom. I hit bottom, and I was uh, emotionally ready to sign out, just ready to accept the end. But God had another plan. And that's so true with so many people in this world. 
Just when they think it's over, it's not over until God says it's over. And if you accept his plan, life comes with it. Not only life here on earth, but life everlasting. And when I came to realize that, that Christmas, I put down my crack pipe, I put down my pills, I put down everything and embraced a loving God through Jesus Christ. You came to faith uh, because something was wrong in, in your life. What was it exactly that led you to that place and that gave you the strength to put down the crack pipe? I mean, these things are not so easy to do, even if you wanted to. A lot of people would like to quit drugs or whatever. I, uh, I was supposed to be uh, a celebrity on uh, Super Password Plus. And uh, three days before that, I started getting high. And after two, three, two nights and three days of being awake, I fell asleep. And uh, about 10 hours later, they got through to me. And it was six hours past when I was supposed to be at that television show. And my manager quit me right there. He said, I'm done with you. I'm finished. He said, your name, it's mud in this town. He said, trust so me. So this wasn't the first time that this, no, like this I happened? Had, no, I had messed up once before. I was only, you know, 15, 20 minutes late. This time I was really in trouble. And so I got depressed, and it was an excuse to get even higher. And I did. And, uh, and I got really depressed because I figured I had thrown my career away. Uh, like you say, it was 13 years that I had tossed down the drain just that day. So I didn't really want to live for a moment. And uh, my younger brother, who was a minister, called me and said, where have you, we've been trying to reach you. We thought you were coming to mother's house for Christmas. He said, mother had a dream last night that you were about to die and that, um, that the devil was playing with you. And I said, look, don't worry about me. You guys just take care of yourselves. All right, I'm okay, I'll be fine. He said, no, you won't. He said, and I want you to pray with me right now. So he started praying with me and I started weeping. I just wept like a baby. And I never really told him how strung out I was at the time or how desperately depressed I was. But that prayer helped wake me up. And I began to pray and I called another brother after I hung up the phone, who lived in Santa Clarita, and I asked him to come down and drive me to LAX, and I lived in Hollywood. He said, I'll be right there. So people who know the geography, that's a long way to drive. I mean, that's uh, for as far out of, his, out of his way as could be. So he got there, and he, I had sealed all the windows for privacy. He opened up windows. He opened the doors on this penthouse apartment that I had and the wind blew in the window and he put a Bible down on the table and he went to the piano and he started playing hymns and uh, the Bible was blowing in the wind I, I'm not even kidding the Bible blew open and landed on a page and I looked down and it said create in me a clean heart renew a right spirit in me ah uh, and I will praise you to the congregation, to the multitudes. So there not only was what I needed, but a purpose and a mission for my life all in one psalm. It was a wonderful thing to see, and it brought me all the way face to face with my maker. And uh, I gave my heart and my life to him. 
And uh, I decided, though, I needed to get clean. So I went with my praying brother in Connecticut just to get away from Hollywood for a while, a couple of weeks. And uh, while I was there, the phone rang, and I was invited to come to Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, to speak to an event. And I said, you know, funny thing, you called. I wanted to go back to college. They said, you do? You want to come out? You want to leave the business and come back to college? I said, yes. They said, we can make that happen. So I got a full scholarship to Oakwood College in Alabama, and I majored in ministry. When that finished, uh, I went on to grad school in Michigan. And uh, on a full scholarship, I received a Master of Divinity degree. And just at the very end of that degree, when all my finals were just about done, I had decided not to sit for the final exams on exam day. I would write a paper for each class, which I did, 25 pages on each class. Wow. And that date was significant because I received a call from an old producer in Hollywood who found me and who said, would you come and screen test for a men to play a minister on the date that I was supposed to be taking my final exams in grad school, but I was free. And so I went to Hollywood, I did the screen test, I became Reverend Reuben Gregory on Amen, and only God could orchestrate a life like that. I mean, that's a fact. Uh, I have to tell you, Clifton Davis, uh, I knew it would be fun to, to talk to you, um, but I didn't, didn't think it, it could be this much fun. It's just, uh, and not just fun, but a, but a deep, deep blessing. I, I would like to have you back as soon as possible just to keep talking because uh, you're just such a treasure trove of, so of much, stories Eric. and things and a, and a big blessing and a big encouragement uh, to a lot of people out there. So we'll just, uh, we'll just say au revoir. I will see you soon. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with me and my audience. I'm just thrilled. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Eric.